In this video, we're going to look at the conditions under which first order perturbation theory is valid for computing the coupling constants and the splitting between uh, coupled peaks in NMR. So we have the spectrum here that we saw in the previous video. We've got two chemically distinguishable protons there in a given molecule. So each of these peaks, let's say, integrates to one proton. Uh, the, each set of peaks here integrates to one proton. And these peaks, the center of them is separated by some value nu naught times sigma 1 minus sigma 2. Nu naught is the frequency of the spectrometer, and sigma 1 and sigma 2 are the shielding constants of proton 1 and proton 2, respectively. Um, this being proton 1 that I've marked here at the higher chemical shift, and this being proton 2 at the lower chemical shift. And I put an absolute value in there because I'm just being lazy about the sign. But it's about the difference between the chemical, difference between the shielding constants that determines the difference between the chemical shifts. And then we have the separation between the two peaks within a given proton that are coupled to each other. We have, let's say, nu1 minus and nu1 plus, just to give them some kind of distinct name. And they're separated by J12 hertz. So J12, the coupling constant, is given in terms of hertz. Uh, whereas the, in order to get, in order for it to be in terms of hertz for the difference between these two peaks here, you have to do the frequency of the spectrometer times the difference in the shielding constants. Okay, so then the formula for each of these peaks in terms of their frequency, what the frequency of absorption or the resonance frequency will be for each of these four peaks. Uh, for nu1 plus or minus, that'll be the spectrometer frequency times 1 minus shielding constant plus or minus J12 coupling constant over 2. And then for nu2, the peaks of proton 2, you have nu2 plus or minus equals nu0 times 1 minus shielding constant sigma 2 plus or minus coupling constant J12 over 2. Okay, so in the previous video, we used perturbation theory, or first-order perturbation theory, in order to derive this kind of result for these peaks. So under what conditions is first-order perturbation theory valid? Because, as we all know, perturbation theory breaks down uh, when your system is more than just a tiny perturbation away from some reference system. Then you might have to use per second-order perturbation theory. You might have to use some type of variational method. But eventually, low-order perturbation theories will break down. Okay, so that condition is going to be if J12 is the coupling constant is much, much less than the default spectrometer frequency, nu naught, times the difference between the shielding constants, sigma 1 minus sigma 2. If that's true, then we can use first order perturbation theory and it's going to be pretty accurate. Okay, so we can have some different types of spectra based off of whether or not this condition is met. So let's say we're talking about two peaks where this is the case. So we're going to say J12 is less than, much, much less than nu naught times the absolute value of sigma 1 minus sigma 2. And let's also pretend that these are the only two peaks on the spectrum as well. Then we would call this an AX spectrum. So we're going to use some letters here to denote what the spectrum actually consists of and some subscripts for how many protons there are. So the A, there's one proton over here, which we label proton A, and another proton which is far away, far down the spectrum, just like A and X are far away down the alphabet from one another. So this would be peak A and this is peak X because they are split by far, far greater of a frequency than the amount at which they are coupled. And remember, we only usually have a, an, a visible coupling constant whenever protons are within about three, three or four chemical bonds of one another. If they're, if they're more physically separated than that, then they usually don't have a significant coupling constant. They're usually not coupled to one another. Then we could have the case where that's not met. So we could have J12 is approximately or on the same order of magnitude as nu naught times our delta sigma, sigma 1 minus sigma 2. And in these case, this case, they are tightly coupled. They are quite close to each other. If this is about the same, then these peaks would be right up next to each other. And we could call this an AB spectrum. 
So just like A and B are close to each other on the alphabet, an A peak and a B peak are very close to one another on the spectrum. They are tightly coupled, and first-order perturbation theory will break down. You actually won't get this nice split peaks here. You'll get something which is uh, quite a different shape, which we'll go on to in uh, later videos on second-order spectra. So using this type of system, we can have various types of nomenclatures for various types of spectra. So we could have something like a3, B2, X, where there'd be three protons in an A peak, three chemically equivalent protons in an A peak. That's pretty close to two protons in peak B. And then farther, way farther downfield or way farther upfield, you have X, which is a which is a peak of one proton, which isn't coupled strongly to either A or B. And then we could have something like say A. B3X2, different example, but with different numbers of protons, three protons in B, two protons in X. Or you could have something just like AX2. Maybe there is no B peak, and it's just these two by themselves. Or you could have like A3B. So you might see that type of nomenclature to discuss various kinds of spectra, and that's that's what they're talking about, whether or not this coupling between them is is very nice and distinct and you can use first order perturbation theory or not depending on whether these letters are close to each other or far away in the alphabet. Okay, so looking a little further into this, we have this condition J12 is much much less than nu naught times sigma 1 minus sigma 2. So let's analyze the different parts of this that can make this statement either true or false. So what I could do is divide both sides by J12 then what I have is nu naught times delta sigma, absolute value of sigma 1 minus sigma 2, over J12, my coupling constant. We have that that value is much, much greater than 1 if a spectrum is first order. OK, so this has various parts to it. So what, we, what conditions can make this true? So we have a spectrum becomes first order if so it becomes it becomes more like a first order spectrum under these following conditions um, you can have at high spectrometer power so as new naught goes up and up and up things look more like a first order spectrum and this makes sense because you know for example that a 700 megahertz spectrometer is much much more powerful than a 60 megahertz spectrometer and it has the ability to resolve many more peaks than a 60 megahertz spectrometer does which is why 700 megahertz is kind of the standard for things that require a lot of resolution things like uh, uncovering the 3d structure of an entire protein so uh, with a very powerful spectrometer Peaks which are not first order in other, spect in other spectrometers can become first order just because that spectrometer is so powerful that the frequency which, with which these peaks are separated uh, far outweighs the, the coupling constant there. Note that this diff distance between the peaks here, that scales with the spectrometer frequency, whereas J12 is a constant. It's separated by the coupling is that many hertz uh, no matter what the spectrometer frequency is. Um, it's also going to become first order at high difference between sigma 1 and sigma 2. So if, they, if these two are very, very far apart in the field, they have a very large chemical shift difference, then they're going to become first order because uh, they're not going to be close to each other on the spectrum. So they're not going to very strongly interact in a way which goes beyond first order perturbation theory. So that makes sense. So something like Something that's attached to very, very electronegative neighbors uh, will not enter, will not be uh, beyond first order with something which is just attached attached to kind of a general general alkane structure. So having a very large difference in chemical shifts makes these two first order, as that chemical shift difference becomes larger and larger. And note that the difference in the chemical shift is directly proportional to the difference in the magnetic shielding as derived in previous videos. And then it also becomes first order. So 
So we can make this go up, make this value larger. We can make this product, this uh, term go up, make this uh, product larger. And what we can also do is make our denominator smaller. So if our denominator becomes smaller, this term becomes bigger and becomes much, much larger, perhaps much, much larger than one. So as J12 becomes very low, you're also going to get a first order spectrum. Of course, that makes things difficult then because at very low J12, uh, your spectrometer has to be able to resolve the two peaks. So if you, if you have a case where uh, your coupling constant is low enough, these two peaks will just merge back together into one peak. So for very, very small values of coupling constants, uh, they're going to behave first order, but you're going to need a very, very strong spectrometer even to resolve the fact that there are two peaks there. This is why we say that generally for coupled peaks, you want them to be within three or four covalent bonds of one another for protons, because if they are more than that, this coupling constant gets so low that it just becomes very, very difficult for the spectrometer to resolve it. So generally what we're talking about when we're looking at this product for what becomes first order, we're talking about this product of spectrometer frequency times difference in shielding. Usually that we're talking about that's greater than about 10 to 20 times the coupling constant. So if you have some, some single digit uh, difference, some single digit value here, usually that's going to be somewhat coupled. Below 5, it's going to be very strongly coupled. And once you get to about 25 or 30, you're going to see almost no visible signs uh, of deviation away from this type of peak. And we'll examine what, what happens at those various cases uh, later on in videos on second order spectra.